The antiquity of ancient Greece is still prevalent in the modern legal system. No judiciary court is complete without a statue of a blindfolded Themis, the goddess of justice from Greek mythology. Ancient Greece could be stated as the perfect midpoint between barbaric justice and a well-structured legal system. They had court hearings, but they also had stoning and crucifixions and harsh punishments for petty crimes. Welcome to Nutty History. Today, let's find out what punishments were like in ancient Greece. The Greek civilization began pretty much soon after the collapse of the Late Bronze Age that marked the end of Minoans. In fact, although Crete became part of Greece later on, the two civilizations have nothing in common except that Minoans were a heavy influence on Greek religion. But that's pretty much it. The first 300 years of ancient Greece civilization are known as the Dark Age of Ancient Greece. From 1200 BC to 900 BC, Ancient Greeks had no official laws or punishments, and the principle of Talion dominated the judiciary. The principle of Talion in simpler terms can be defined as an eye for an eye. For example, a man guilty of committing murder would be offered to the family of the killed victim who in turn had the right to kill the murderer. However, as you might have guessed already, this ruling created a loop of endless feuds for generations among two families, just like the mafias killing each other in movies over an argument of who fired the first bullet. It was not until the middle of the 7th century BC in the Archaic Age that the Greeks began to establish official laws. According to Aristotle, six junior archons or magistrates who were called Thermersetai were appointed in Athens around 683 BC to document perhaps the first ever laws. Yet, according to modern historians, the credit for the first constitution and penal system in Greece goes to Draco. Not much is known who he was or where he came from, but the consensus is that he was a Greek nobility from Attica. But even if Draco's code wasn't the first reduction of Athenian law into writing, it was still likely the first comprehensive written code in the history of Greece. Some might say comprehensive is an overstatement given how linear this penal code was under Draco's constitution. Instated during the 39th Olympiad, Draco's laws were as simple as they could be. Petty thievery? Off with your head. Kill someone in cold blood? Off with your head. Living homeless? You guessed it. Off with his head! It is said that Draco himself, when asked why he had fixed the punishment of death for most offenses, answered that he considered these lesser crimes deserving of it, and he had no greater punishment for more important ones. Dude loved beheadings. This is why today's governments, ruling with an iron fist, are sometimes referred to as draconian. Indeed, Draco's laws were problematic for Athens, and the cruelty and lack of fairness called for a change in the penal code. Now, if you're wondering what kind of laws the rest of Greece had during this time, here are two important details. First, as writing wasn't as fashionable as it is now, there is not much information available about the rest of the Greek city-states. Spartans, in fact, downright hated to pick a chisel or quill instead of a sword. This is Sparta! Second, there was never a system of institutions recognized as a legal order in other cities. They more or less followed Athens' model of the penal system, with Sparta being at the extreme opposite end of it. For Spartans, honor and integrity mattered a lot, and they treated women as one should, with equality. This ideology was reflected in their law and punishment system as well, and set them apart from the rest of Greece. Spartans would cast their serious criminals to die in a dry well, while lesser crimes were punished with whippings, exile, and seizing of property. The Classical Age, 5th century to 2nd century BC, witnessed the true flash of ancient Greek legislation. The law became orderly and was divided into branches with the separation of material and procedural laws. This era began thanks to Solon's reforms in the early 6th century BC. Solon took the lawmaking away from rulers and kings and placed it in the hands of appointed officials who were basically scribes with one purpose, to write laws. What is my purpose? Pass the butter. Most of the lawgivers were middle-class members of the aristocracy, and many were archons before becoming a lawgiver. The officials in the government wanted to make sure that lawgivers won't take sides or be a part of just one group. Otherwise, the judicial system might be unfair. However, that doesn't mean they were not unfair to women, because women weren't even considered human in ancient Greece. 
and thus lawgivers were not a part of the normal government. They were considered political outsiders. In a broad sense, Salon's laws served as guidelines for the judges instead of hard-coded regulations. These guidelines told step-by-step -step details on how the law should be enforced. Procedural laws even included such minute details as how many witnesses must be called in each particular case and who could serve as a witness and so forth. In ancient Greece, the judiciary system was pretty much social work and driven by non-professionals. Court employees were rarely paid, and most claims were tried on the same day private cases even more quickly. They were neither officials nor lawyers. A normal case consisted of two litigants, one from each side, who respectively argued for the prosecution and the defense. The case was decided by a group of jurors, who acted almost in the same way as modern juries of Western civilization. It was their responsibility to discern if a person was either guilty or not guilty, after which another vote by the jury would decide the punishment. However, like Supreme Courts today, Greeks had archons and ephiti who were the magistrates and had the final say in legal proceedings. Around 403 and 402 BC, they were replaced by dikastai, who were democratically elected jurors. Greeks believed during the classical age that the foundation for the punishment was anger of a person, and thus he should pay the price for expressing it towards others. The guilty would be forced to pay victims and sometimes Athens city as well for his wrongdoings. In a way, money had replaced the principle of talion. Imprisonment was only used for those who were not able to afford the fine. More severe punishments, such as exile or capital punishment, could be used for crimes that touched society as a whole. Apart from homicide, this also included disrespect towards the state or official religion. Despite being a democracy, Greeks were not much fond of free thinking and consider it dangerously insulting. This is why so many philosophers who later formed the pride of Greece had to pass through criminal procedures and punishment. Socrates, who had been convicted to death by poisoning, was the most famous of them. Speaking of Socrates, the philosopher was supposed to get crucified. Did you know that? At the time, crucifixion was not as bloody and graphical as you may have seen on Jesus' figures in movies. In classical age Greece, the convict was fastened to a board with iron collars around his wrist, ankles, and neck, and the collar around the neck was tightened to strangle the wrongdoer. Socrates, too, probably would have suffered such fate had he not had wealthy friends. From the end of the 5th century, the Athenians seem to have been willing to let wrongdoers convicted to death use hemlock to commit suicide in advance of their execution, provided they could afford to pay for the dose, which cost 12 drachmas. It is hard to put an exchange value to ancient currencies in modern perspective, but that has not stopped economists and historians from estimating the value of drachma according to purchasing power parity. By their calculation, an ancient Greek drachma would cost about $46, making the cost of poison nearly worth $540. That is one costly way to take your own life. However, exile was a more preferred and popular punishment among Athenians. Even prisoners on death row were expected to make a jailbreak and not return to Athens for a long period. Exile life wasn't as easy as you might be thinking. Making money as a foreigner in strange lands wasn't as feasible back in the day. When Solon was appointed lawgiver after Draco in about 594 BC, he drafted many new laws, terminating much of draconian rules except for the homicide law. Before becoming an archon, Solon was the reason behind Athens' win over Megara for the claim of the island of Salamis. But without him, Athens perhaps would have never become a world-renowned democracy, as his reforms laid the foundation for helping Athens become a fairer city-state, women and slaves not included. During Salon's time, many Greek city-states had seen the emergence of tyrants like Draco, who followed the same ideology of death to all criminals and opponents. Under Salon, laws had specific penalties for specific crimes. Most crimes were punished by monetary, payment penalties. For example, the fine for sexual assault, which would be nearly $4,700 in modern times. Not gonna lie, that sounds like an awful way to deal with such a delicate matter. But this was the time and place where women were considered subhuman. The penalty for theft depended on the amount stolen, and the guilty would have to pay back double. Murderers and kidnappers were thrown into a pit of sharp spikes called the Baratheon. But when it came to women, foreigners and slaves, equality was an alien concept. Women and slaves were not allowed to represent themselves in court and had to have their guardian or owner stand for them respectively. 
Flogging and whipping were quite common punishments for slaves. Women were prone to stoning or being put into stocks when being found guilty. But nothing came close to rephanidosis, an oddity among the other more humane punishments for Greek men. Rephanidosis was a punishment reserved for extreme cases. It is mentioned by Aristophanes as a punishment for adultery in classical Athens in the 5th and 4th century BC. Rephanidosis was allegedly sentenced for other sex-related crimes as well as perhaps such as adultery and sodomy. Now, mind you, assaulting and violating a woman was only fined in contrast with a hundred drachmas. So what is rephanidosis? Botanists watching this video may have already recognized the use of the genus Raphinus in the term. The Raphinus genus contains mostly root-based food-producing plants such as radishes. Raphanidosis was the act of publicly inserting the root of a plant-like radish into the rectum. Raphanidosis was pretty much a humiliating death sentence. The radish had thorns attached to them, causing the guilty to die of internal hemorrhaging on receiving the punishment. However, was such extreme punishment ever used or was it a brainchild of a rather creative writer of that time is still up to debate among historians. So, what do you think? Does the Greek penal system need a revival or are we lucky to live in a more humane and sophisticated era? Tell us in the comments and don't forget to smash that like button. Oh, and thanks for watching Nutty History.